The next artist we're going to talk about, his name was Pietro Vannucci, but he's never called that. He's always known by his nickname, Perugino. And of course, it refers to his place of birth. He was actually born in a small town, Città uh, delle Pieva, uh, but in, uh, near Perugia. So he's known as the Perugian. Uh, he had a large workshop in Perugia. He had another workshop in Florence. Uh, he was a very, very popular painter. Um, he was a very popular painter. And in his day, he was considered to be the greatest painter of all. Uh, the only rival was that young Leonardo da Vinci, who, of course, as we know, far surpassed Perugino in fame eventually. Pier Eugenio's most famous pupil was Raphael. And uh, we will be seeing some of the lyrical grace of Pier Eugenio, uh, certainly influences his pupil Raphael. Let's look at the work here. Raphael's paintings uh, show a great interest in space, as we'll see. They also show a great interest in very graceful, peaceful, uh, beautiful figures, uh, very calm. Uh, your book calls them emotionless. I'm not quite certain that's true, but we'll talk about it. Um, it's a calm emotion, let's just say that. And Vasari did not like Pier Eugenio's work, evidently. He did a job on him. Vasari calls him an atheist. I don't know if that was true or not, but Pier Eugenio certainly is the author of beautiful devotional work. Uh, so uh, if, if that has any truth in it, it doesn't show up in his paintings. Um, one of the other things that Vasari criticized Pier Eugenio for uh, was the repetition of figures. Now, that would have been a very normal thing in the 15th century. And it also would have been a very normal thing for someone who has a large workshop uh, and is traveling between Perugia and Florence and Rome and has you know, many, many commissions, which he's going to have his workshop working on them. Um, and he would probably have a pattern book uh, and from which uh, many of these figures would be uh, drawn uh, and then you know, variations applied. Uh, but that, as I said, was a very normal way of working. Also, some of the works of art uh, that uh, today we look at and we say, gee, that's similar to something else, uh, would have been painted in, for example, a, a different uh, convent, perhaps, and no one would have ever seen it but the nuns. Uh, so. The 16th century idea of, oh, you must be completely original, invincione, uh, is not quite the idea that was uh, prevalent in the late 15th century. So um, you can decide whether you want to blame Per Eugenio for not being ahead of his time uh, and just enjoy his, uh, or just enjoy his uh, beautiful figures. What we're looking at here is one of the pictures that he painted for the Sistine Chapel. And um, of course, Pope Sixtus IV uh, ordered this chapel built uh, that's attached to the Vatican. It's known as the Sistine Chapel after Pope Sixtus. And he wanted to have it uh, decorated right away. <laughs> so as soon as it was built, he called down not just one artist or two artists, but he just called all of the leading artists of Italy down to paint the walls of his chapel with scenes from the life of Christ and scenes of the Old uh, Testament predecessors of Christ. Uh, and some of these artists were, well, we've heard of them. Uh, per Eugenio, Botticelli, uh, Ghirlandaio, uh, Cosimo Rosalie with his assistant, Piero di Cosimo, um, Pinturicchio, uh, and of course here, Per Eugenio. Um, this would have been a very significant subject for the Pope. 
uh, because this is this this is a reference uh, to Christ's words in the Bible uh, that gives the papal authority. And sometimes I just call the painting uh, the keys to the kingdom, which is because a short version. Uh, the long version is Christ giving Peter the kings to the kingdom of heaven. In the Bible, Christ says to the apostle Peter, you are the rock on which I will found my church. And of course, there's a kind of pun in Latin between the name Peter and the word for rock or stone. Uh, which they're you know very very similar. So Christ says to Peter, "You are the you are the rock on which I will found my church, and I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven." And those those are the words. That is the verse on which the papal claims uh, to. Uh, supremacy over the church, to the power over the church, uh, uh, the claims to papal power are founded uh, because Peter was the first bishop of Rome and um, the popes are the bishops of Rome and they claim that by apostolic succession they have the power of Peter to bind and to loose on earth and on heaven. So certainly a very important subject for a papal church. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is there seems to be, uh, you know, sort of planes across the surface in which you have uh, large figures in the foreground uh, and then uh, smaller figures in the middle ground. And then you have these uh, great architectural structures in the background and then the, the distant mountains in the future. So this planar recession into death, which is all laid out with, as you can certainly see from the grid lines, uh, linear perspective, uh, showing you a uh, extremely spacious place. Though there's probably no place that's quite that spacious in a city uh, in Italy. Um, so in the foreground, we have Jesus giving to Peter these uh, very large keys uh, that are symbolic of the power of the popes. Uh, and uh, on either side, his apostles. and other what, people looking on. Uh, as we go back, uh, on the left, there is a scene of uh, people trying to trip up Christ uh, by showing him a, um, and here you see uh, uh, just a diagram of showing you how the linear perspective is laid out, which you can certainly see from the paving stones. In the background, we have classical architecture. We have two triumphal arches and uh, a octagonal temple that presumably represents the temple of Jerusalem. Uh, so here you have a detail uh, and you can see a comparison with the triumphal arch of Constantine. Uh, it's not an exact copy, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, uh, he's, uh, has the, but it's uh, pretty close. Uh, and the small group of figures here in the middle ground are the story of render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Uh, basically, the detractors of Christ were trying to trip him up uh, and get him to say something that you know, he could be condemned with. Uh, and so they come to him and say, well, what do you think? Should we pay our taxes to Caesar? Now, you have to remember that in ancient Judea was Ancient Judea was a subject country. They were under the rule of Rome, and they were not happy about it. They wanted to be freed from uh, the rule of Rome. So it was kind of like whatever Jesus said, he was going to be in the wrong. If he said, no, you shouldn't pay your taxes to Rome, well, then he would be a traitor to Rome, and they could go to the Roman governor and uh, have him condemned. But if he said, yes, you should, well, then who would pay attention to him because he's obviously a traitor to his own people? So what happens? They ask Jesus the question, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus says, show me a coin. And they pull out a coin. Of course, it's a Roman coin. And he says, 
you know, whose visage, whose face is on this? Because most of the Roman coins were struck with a profile figure of uh, the ruling emperor. And they say, Caesar's. And he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. On the other side, uh, we see another triumphal arch and a scene where uh, the people were trying to stone Jesus to death. But in the Gospel of St. John, it says that he walked through their midst. You know, did he become invisible? But somehow, miraculously, he was delivered from this uh, by, his, you know, by the power of God. And then, right smack dab in the center of the background, we have this uh, domed uh, octagonal building uh, with porticos on either side. Uh, presumably, that is supposed to represent the Temple of Jerusalem, who is often shown as a, a domed and uh, circular building, uh, probably because of uh, a misunderstanding. On the site of the Temple of Jerusalem, was sitting the Dome of the Rock, uh, the uh, Islamic uh, uh, mosque. Uh, it marks, it's a very sacred site for uh, many of people. Of course, the site of the Temple of, of Solomon and uh, the site where, uh, where uh, Mohammed was supposed to have ascended into heaven. So because this was on that site, many of the pilgrims came back thinking that the temple of Jerusalem uh, looked, uh, at least was in some way, uh, like the Dome of the Rock, uh, which was a, a centralized domed building. Uh, this, of course, looks much more classical. It does not look like the Dome of the Rock. Per Eugenia was never in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, so he uses uh, uh, classical uh, motifs to create his, uh, in this case, octagonal building. One of the most beautiful Per Eugenos, and there are many beautiful Per Eugenos, uh, is the crucifixion uh, that is in the National Gallery in Washington. It is serene, it is calm, uh, it is lyrical. Uh, your book says that the figures are emotionless. I would suggest that it's a quiet meditation, uh, that it's not supposed to be um, a representation of the exact moment when Christ was crucified and all the events that went on at the time, as it is a timeless appearance. You know, there are different ways you can represent the crucifixion. You can show the suffering and the agony. Or you can do what Per Eugenio did. Uh, it's almost like, you know, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Uh, and making this, you know, as I said, a timeless event. Uh, in which Christ really does not seem to suffer. And that actually could refer, perhaps, to the Mass, which, which this would be an altarpiece, and the Mass would be performed on the altar, and the Mass reenacts the crucifixion of Christ without him suffering. But it makes merits without Christ having to suffer again. This is the kind of crucifixion that you could meditate on, uh, that you could pray in front of, and you don't have to start striking your breasts and going mea, mea culpa and weeping. There's something comforting about it, uh, as though everything's going to be all right. You know, the crucifixion will be followed by the resurrection. In the center, we have only three figures, a kind of implied triangle with the apex uh, as uh, Christ at a uh, at Christ's head. And so we have Christ on the cross, but as I say, he doesn't seem to be suffering. And I want to point out the loincloth, uh, that you have this beautiful arabesque of the, uh, the end of the loincloth. And that tells you something. You know, he's interested in showing you these beautiful curving shapes. And then, standing on either side of the cross, there is Mary, the mother, with her head bowed. You know, she is the Stabat Mater. Uh, she's not showing suffering. She's showing as though she's full of faith, uh, that she believes that this will, you know, all will come to good. You know, we know the resurrection will happen. 
Uh, on the other side as the beloved disciple John, the only one of the 12 apostles who stood by Christ at the, uh, at the cross. And his hands are folded. Uh, it's this kind of wonderful curve that goes down. And you might notice uh, that the curve of his drapery uh, is uh, sort of the, the reverse of the drapery of the Madonna. They're very similar figures, uh, maybe a common model uh, with the variations. When you look at the side, you'll see, for example, that Mary Magdalene seems to be from the same pattern as John. She's in a very similar pose. But the repetition of these curving forms you know, adds to this feeling of uh, tranquility. I also want you to take a look at that beautiful landscape and how Christ is silhouetted against the sky. And you have these uh, clouds that sort of follow along uh, the shape of the crossbar and then the sky becomes very very clear and pale and you have this atmospheric landscape that just uh, extends out. Well, uh, you might even notice that little bridge and uh, some of these uh, cupola on the on the distant uh, figures. Actually I can find paintings of Hans Memlink where I can find those very motifs. And the way Pierre Eugenio paints his trees, uh, they're sort of ovoid uh, with little dots of lighter green, uh, is very similar to the technique that Memlink uses as well. So certainly that landscape, and as will be seen, some of the details do show that he has been looking at Netherlandish art and I would say specifically the art of Hans Memling. Um, looking here at the base of the cross, we have these uh, different flowers, which uh, may be symbolic. It shows a knowledge of Netherlandish art where they frequently have very realistic uh, plants, flowers in the foreground uh, with a lot of detail. Uh, Hugo van der Hoos's Portinari altar has um, not the growing plants, but plants in the vessels uh, at the foreground. And, um, you know, you find these in, in Memlink and uh, other artists. Now, I said that that crucifixion was a timeless image. And it is because you have a figure who was certainly not present at the crucifixion. In the left, pan in the left panel, we see St. Jerome. St. Jerome in the wilderness as uh, the ascetic saint who uh, beats his breast with a rock. And you see uh, behind him, sort of in the middle distance, uh, the lion uh, whose uh, uh, paw he, uh, who, the lion uh, from whom Jerome took the thorn. And then the lion became very tame and uh, uh, say, stayed with St. Jerome. So we see his uh, uh, reference to that lion back there. Well, of course, St. Jerome was living when? In the late 4th, early 5th century? Uh, he wasn't present historically at the crucifixion. But here we see him, uh, the uh, translator of the Bible from Greek into Latin. We see him as though he is an example of an ascetic uh, saint who meditates on the crucifixion. And serves as a kind of example to us. And if we look at the details, you can see uh, the way the light, uh, you can see the way that the, the um, and as you look at the details, you, see, you can see the treatment of the bushes with the little light dots of paint, uh, lighter green on those, as the light was shining on the leaves. As I say, it's a technique that you see in Memlink. Um, and then the, the detailed naturalism of the plant forms in front. On the other side, we see Mary Magdalene, uh, pretty much in exactly the same pose as uh, St. John. Uh, she's in her own separate wing in the wilderness, uh, once again, meditating on uh, the death of Christ. You might also notice that there is a little tree in the background that curves over, as though it's bending over, and it follows the shape of the Magdalene's uh, body. 
And some of the rocks, oh, these very uh, craggy, striated rocks, also do the same. And then we also have the, the trees with which we're seeing the uh, light shining through the leaves. That's another thing you'll see in Memling's paintings. And you will, in one particular painting by Memling, see a tree that bends over in the same way. Uh, it's, it has a purpose there. It uh, bends over uh, because it's part of a legend in which a tree bent over so Joseph could get to, uh, fruit off of the tree, the legend of the date palm. Now, was that picture in Italy? Uh, probably not. But there were other paintings in Italy uh, that uh, would have informed Perugino of some of the things that the Netherlandish artists were doing. And so you have these wonderful rock formations with light streaming through the clouds. And here is a, a perfect example of uh, Memlink influencing Perugino, and then that will come to influence uh, the history of portraiture in Italy. Uh, this is a portrait of Francesco della Opera, it's painted in 1494, and we see him as a sort of uh, more than a bust figure. I'm not quite half length, uh, sort of three quarter length maybe, uh, with the fingers resting on the edge of the frame. Now that is a Netherlandish motif that you see frequently, uh, particularly in paintings of Hans Memling um, and others. And uh, he has a beautiful landscape stretched out behind him. Uh, he's holding a kind of scroll with an inscription on it, which uh, translates as fear God. So this seems to be a secular portrait. He's not praying uh, to a saint. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, it is showing uh, what the piety of the figure. And here is an example of a painting that was in Italy. It still is uh, painted by Memling. It seems to be an Italian uh, it seems to be an it Italian uh, patron with the landscape stretching out behind. Uh, once again, a bit more than the bust length, certainly not three quarter of the length, with the fingers holding a, uh, a paper, a folded paper, and the tips of the fingers resting on the frame. What Memling very frequently did when we have the original frame, we can see this, uh, is paint just the fingertip right onto the frame as though uh, the, the uh, sitter is looking through a window. Uh, 